and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 217, recorded on November 28th, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. And we start this week with what might just end up the first RISC-V powered phone you'll be able to catch your hands on. And it could be just around the corner. With Linux support nearly complete for several RISC-V chipsets and an increasing quantity of chips powering Linux single board computers with prices as low as $12, RISC-V seems to be entering a new phase of maturation. With this next phase comes the next major challenge, though, turning this all into an ecosystem for both developers and product builders. Yeah, but that said, compared to ARM, RISC-V is really seeing, for hardware, a breakneck paced adoption in the industry. And I think there's a lot of reasons for this, but anybody that's been listening to this show for a while knows a lack of certain royalties and the attractive licensing around RISC-V is absolutely helping. But on top of those factors, you've got world politics playing a role and the fact that vendors can customize these to specifically suit their needs. And Android support is finally getting in much better shape. It was helped definitely by later versions of Android tracking much closer to the mainline Linux kernel, which has improved its RISC-V support a lot in recent years. Alibaba has also been one of the first to produce a working Android 10 port over to the RISC-V architecture, complete even with GPU drivers. But this week, leading RISC-V manufacturer SciSpeed demoed a full Android 10 system on a 7-inch touchscreen. This was building off some of their work last year when SciSpeed produced the smartphone-like Mike's Amigo development kit as the first experiment of a free hardware PDA. One part development kit, one part learning kit, I guess you could say. It was a fairly robust-looking device and not all that impressive spec-wise, but an early wrist device nonetheless. And you could easily see them putting something like that together, but maybe version 2 is powered by a RISC-V chip in there. And supply chain shortages aside, from what I'm reading, all of the bits are really there. They just need to put it all together in a mobile dev kit now. And according to SciSpeed, a RISC-V device like this, like a little phone or learning kit, would be more powerful than like a quad-core A73 ARM processor. So possibly in line with Qualcomm Snapdragon 663 or 662 SoCs. We'll keep our ears on the party line and give you a ring if a RISC-V Linux phone comes a column. But while we're speaking of super cheap RISC-V devices, measuring just 46 by 25 millimeters in the style of a Pi compute module, the all-winner D1 packs a 1 gigahertz CPU and 512 megs of DDR3 RAM, all for just $17. Just like a first glance looking at this thing, it looks like a stick of RAM, like a laptop small size stick of RAM with just a few extra bits on it. They're designed to slot right into a docking board that will have additional connectivity, maybe like HDMI, Ethernet, and GPIO pins, etc. But I like to take these things to like an extreme version, maybe that's years down the road, and I picture a blade server with like 300 of these things, and they're all installed inside this one larger box integrated into some sort of high-speed backplane, making it like a ginormous Beowulf cluster in a box. I like where you're going with this, but uh, they've actually got to ship these things first. Uh, Thankfully, though, the D1 is available now on AliExpress, and those docking boards are supposed to start shipping within the next month or so. It's a holiday week here in the States, and so there's not a lot of breaking news in the Linux and open source community. But there actually have been a few essential developments we wanted you to be aware of. In the background... For years, the LLVM project has been working on a massive relicensing effort for its code base. And we wanted to bring it to your attention this week because A, there's been some developments, but B, LLVM is a critical part of the open source ecosystem, so we just wanted to keep you apprised. No, it's not the latest and greatest virtual machine manager. In fact, LLVM is not even an acronym. It's just the name of the project, which is a collection of modular and reusable compiler and toolchain technologies been around now for 18 years. It started off as a research project at the University of Illinois, created by Chris Latner, initially focused on C and C++, but built with a language-agnostic design. Yeah, that modular and language-agnostic design turned out to be a huge asset for the project, and today it's just enormous. And it's not just in the open-source community. LLVM has been an integral part of Apple's Xcode development tools for macOS and iOS since Xcode 4. 
And this week, we got an update on their effort to relicense to what effectively will be an Apache 2.0 license, but with an LLVM exception. That exception is just dealing with your code being compiled by LLVM, as well as when pairing LLVM code with the GPL version 2. Currently, LLVM is published under the University of Illinois slash NCSA open source license, which is based on the MIT or X11 and three clause BSD licenses. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, but to make this transition to Apache 2 clean, they need to collect the contributor signatures, the people that have contributed to the code over the years. And surprise, surprise, that is the sticky point right now. The LLVM Foundation has managed to get approval for more than 94% of the older code base, and they're getting really close, but they need 100% to legally relicense it to Apache 2.0. A Google spreadsheet is being used to sort all this out and keep track of who they still need to communicate with so far. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. The hope with this whole license change effort is to clear up the patent section of their former license that led to some unfortunate confusion and organizations not contributing to the project, as well as getting the runtime libraries and the rest of the code under the same unified license and clearing up the wording on the patent rights. In the land of farmers and fishermen in the northern German state of Schleswig-Holstein, there is work afoot to switch 25,000 PCs, to LibreOffice. The state wants to reduce its dependence on proprietary software and eventually end it altogether. Yeah, the goal is by the end of 2026 to have replaced Microsoft Office with LibreOffice on all those 25,000 computers used by civil servants and other government employees, including teachers. Yeah, so that seems to kind of be like a phase one. And they're entertaining the idea of a phase two if that goes well, which would be switch the OSs from Windows to Linux. Now, I know some of us long-timers are getting a solid sense of deja vu here, uh, but I am encouraged by a few lessons that they seem to be applying here. Uh, one of the big ones is they're switching the applications first, getting the users familiar with the very same applications they would end up using on Linux before switching out the OS. Change the apps, then the platform. Yeah, I mean, that cuts the learning curve in half and is leveraging one of the great things about LibreOffice, right? It runs everywhere. That seems like a good thing to me. Another good sign that stood out is that they're not trying to do this just to save money. They're doing this to break out of a dependent vendor relationship. They're not even trying to do the transition on the cheap, which is good. It means you're actually willing to spend the money to try to make something like this effective. Additionally, it seems to be in conjunction with broader thinking about the government's use of open source and selecting services and software that support multiple operating systems. Yep. These are some of the, the changes that, they, that they're implementing compared to how Munich did it a decade ago that do make me want to be more positive. Um, so that's, that's nice to see. But what's underneath a lot of this is a new motivator, which I think is fascinating. So it's like before it was, let's save money by using free software. But now the motivator seems to be more like, we don't want to be locked into a vendor. And we're seeing this time and time again now, this theme for businesses and for governments is they don't want vendor lock-in. Uh, and I, I, that is a, a difference. I don't know. I can't help but be slightly skeptical. It was rough watching Munich over a decade just blow this thing where there were bad choices. You know, they rolled their own distro. There were politics. Uh, there were like Wolf of Wall Street style moves by Microsoft. <laughs> they really torpedoed this really public Linux switch. So it was really hard to watch that. But yeah, I agree, Wes. They seem to be taking a better, probably more practical strategy with it. Well, here's hoping the fishermen and farmers will have a better go at it anyway. <laughs> and whenever government time and money is invested into free software, even if only temporarily, users all around the world benefit together. And that's great. Linode.com slash LAN. That's where we host everything up in the cloud. And I started using Linode before they were a sponsor because they had the best price to performance. They had a great interface. And I could tell after using it for a little bit, they were really Linux geeks. And it it was influencing the product in an absolutely great way. Now we're rounding into our second year of working with Linode, and it's been absolutely enabling for us as an independent business to not only survive, because they are a fantastic client, but also they are where we run everything. We still choose to deploy everything in Linode. It gives us that fast performance. It gives us locations near you, because they have 11 data centers around the world. 
They have the best API out there. It truly is a developer-owned company. They have a 99.99% SLA. They're ready to work in a multi-cloud environment. And when you compare Linode pricing, performance, and features against the hypervisors that want to lock you into their proprietary platforms, Linode crushes it. I mean, independent parties have verified it. Linode is the fastest provider out there, and especially when you look at price and performance. But they have brand new AMD Epic dedicated CPU rigs if you want to go that way. They're rolling out new MVME storage to their systems. And of course, their $5 systems, their like budget-focused systems, are still incredibly powerful. I use that now for game servers and sync thing and all that, all running on one $5 Linode. They really do stack up to the competition. And I, I acknowledge... There is a lot of ways to host something, but nobody does it like Linode. Nobody. And on top of all of that, they have the best customer support in the business. By phone, ticket, or social, they're going to help you. They're going to take care of any problem you have. And that means you can rest easy at night. And I do, knowing that, because that's where my business infrastructure runs. So go build something. Go try something. Go test something. Push it to the limits. See what you can get. And really kick the tires, because Linode's going to give you $100 when you go to linode.com land. Go there to get that $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you support the show. It's a great deal. It's a great opportunity. Linode.com slash LAN. Linux.ting.com. And thanks to Ting for making this episode of Linux Action News possible. Ting is my cell service of choice since 2013. And the trick is that Ting is an MVNO. So they're a virtual operator that runs on top of multiple carriers, and they can focus on great deals and great customer service, not digging holes in the ground. So you get great connectivity and speed on LTE or 5G networks across the nation. And Ting has plans as low as $10 a month. You can dial in the plan that works just for you. A lot of data, a little data, unlimited calls, unlimited texts, you pick. Every plan has access to Ting's award-winning customer service and nationwide LTE and 5G, plus the freedom of no contracts ever. Boom! Ting's been leading the industry on that. And the nice thing is it's so simple to switch to Ting, which means you can start saving money right away. Pretty much any phone's going to work. Just head to linux.ting.com, check out your current phone, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. They're going to have one. Once everything checks out and Ting figures out exactly where your best service is going to be at, they'll send you a SIM card, you pop that into your phone, and you get activated in minutes. It's a great way to get started. And then from then on, you're going to find just about everything you want in the dashboard. A customer since 2013, I've called customer service twice. and Both times it's because I was doing something crazy on a road trip. <laughs> <laughs> and they stuck with me. They really did stick with me. I had a great experience, and you will too. So get started and save $25 when you go to linux.ting.com. That's right, linux.ting.com. See how much you could save, and then take 25 bucks off that. linux.ting.com. Something rather big happened this week in the world of Linux, and specifically Linux distributions, but you'd be easily forgiven if you didn't happen to notice. Amazon announced the release of Amazon Linux 2022. And while not typically a big event, this time, things are a bit different. One of the major changes being that Amazon has rebased their Linux operating system on Fedora. It's a bit of a hybrid, actually, between select bits of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and a whole lot of that Fedora goodness. Well, now, isn't that interesting? Thoughts on that in a moment. But what I noticed is Amazon seems to casually refer to this as AL 2022. And in the release notes, they noticed that, quote, AL 2022 uses the Fedora project as its upstream to provide customers with a wide variety of the latest software, such as uploaded language runtimes, as part of quarterly releases. In addition, AL 2022 has SE Linux enabled and enforced by default. Little round of a quiet applause there, because I think that's really great on systems that are built for cloud workloads. Some other things that they're baking into their distribution include live kernel patching, extra kernel hardening, they have details about that on their GitHub, and they're basing it all on the 5.15 LTS kernel. And then there's the support window. Amazon is recommitting to major versions of the operating system every two years with five years of long-term support. And much like Red Hat or Ubuntu, but a bit abbreviated, there are two phases of support. Each release consists of standard support for two years and then a further three years of maintenance support. Each release receives quarterly minor version updates to provide security updates, bug fixes, and perhaps 
new features. Yeah, that new features thing is going to be interesting to see how customers react to that long term, uh, because that, combined with a Fedora base, seems to really position this thing as aggressively close to upstream. I mean, this is pretty fresh for an enterprise distro, quote unquote. Um, and Amazon, I think, recognizes this. In, in their announcements and on their GitHub, they tout repository locking as an option for those that want something maybe a little less aggressive. Uh, writing on their GitHub, quote, Amazon Linux 2022 gives customers control over how and when they choose updates and provides the ability to lock major and minor versions as well as specific versions of your Amazon Linux repository. This enables you to ensure consistency of package versions and updates across your environment. I've got to be honest that when I'm choosing an OS to run on the cloud, it's not usually Amazon Linux. And of course, that's where you're going to see their distribution running on their cloud and EC2 instances in particular. But it's so neat to see a new distribution come out that's based on Fedora. We just don't see that very often. I do agree that this seems perhaps aggressively upstream for the enterprise, but that's kind of exciting because a lot of these sort of server distros have felt so stale for a long time that you maybe you chose something like Ubuntu because it felt like it, it changed a little bit more often, just a little more fresh flavor if you didn't need the years of support in a lockdown system. In some ways, it feels like Amazon's kind of trying out a new approach and a new part on the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little more aggressive than, say, going with CentOS Stream because it's closer to that Fedora base where Stream is going to be a little more reserved, a little more uh, careful in those updates. Um, and so it's kind of sitting between that, between Fedora and between CentOS Stream. And that's interesting and would normally not be enough. But then you come in and say, oh, by the way, five years of support too, which has always been the Achilles heel of running Fedora in production. Yeah, no one wants to upgrade those every nine months or so. But the other thing that's just casually nice about having a Fedora server is... You understand Fedora 34 as a base or Fedora 35, which is what they're ultimately shooting for. That as a base means XYZ features as a developer to build on. And perhaps a sign of the times, it feels like they're almost leading this announcement with their ARM release. I mean, yeah, sure, there's x86 as well, of course, but they're being quite prominent that those new processors running ARM of theirs in their data centers. Yeah, of course, AL22 is going to be great on there. Yeah, it really is sort of the ultimate Amazon fantasy stack. You get you get an Amazon instance with an Amazon ARM processor running Amazon Linux. The whole thing, it's I could see it working really well for some people, but this would be a lot more exciting to me if these eventually released as ISOs that I could install on any x86 or ARM system. No sign of that just yet, but we'll keep an eye on it. If it does happen, we'll let you know. We'll let you know about anything else that happens in the world of Linux and open source. So be sure you get every single episode by going to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get those new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to keep in touch. Swag bags are back for a little bit longer. Rando swag bags at jupitergarage.com. Now with a Jupiter Journal. It's pretty great. As for us, well, we'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs>